Hi everybody, this is Keith. Welcome to VTS 25. That's right, one more than 24, but one less than 26. Yes, that's right. Uh, hey, it's good to have everybody back. It's um, March 2007, for those who are keeping track on your calendars. Um, we are continuing our conversation, our discussion about um, what, it takes, what it takes to take a shot from blocking to clean up. It's that middle ground, that scary middle ground. Okay. Uh, a little recap, VTS24, we went over um, how to clean up the core of the body in a linear sense. We start from the root to the fruit. Okay. Hips first, get all that working right. The reason I work linear is because I believe that it is my responsibility to define the, the nature of the motion. Okay. And in order to define the nature of the motion, I don't want the computer to do its part. Uh, yes, I could go ahead and pull tangent handles and stuff right now, but that's really hard to deal with. Okay. I, I'm, I know lots of very talented and educated animators do it that way. That's great. I'm just showing you the way I do it. I figure, Hey, you're getting these videos because you want to see the way I do it. Okay. So, um, VTS 24, we covered a lot of that. And um, what we're going to do this month, we're going to continue on with that. Uh, we're going to move into cleaning up, of course, the limbs. And then I'm going to start moving into, well, what it takes to clean up stuff in splines, okay? And you're going to see that all these things I've been going through in the workflow process, from blocking all the way through to breakdowns, through the secondary breakdowns, all the way through to clean up, uh, first pass linear on the core. And then we're going to do first pass linear on the limbs today. And then we're going to start doing core cleanup of spline. And I'm going to teach you some basic principles for spline, okay? Um, there's some really good tutorials out there online. Um, uh, Victor Navone has a couple of tutorials on how to handle splines and how to clean them up. They're excellent tutorials. Um, you should check them out at his site. And uh, so I, I do things very similar to the way he does them, but not exactly. Okay. So we're gonna I'm gonna show you in this video, hands on. I'll explain it as I do it uh, with screen grabs and things like that. I'm going to show you exactly how uh, I like to clean up splines and what I'm thinking of in terms of them. Okay. And again, got to go back and test everything. All right. So I'll talk about more of that as I do the screen grabs. Uh, another thing I want to do is I want to take some time this month to do a little bit of an explanation as to how I self critique my work. Okay. There's a, there's an, a very important aspect of this stage of the cleanup that can either cause you to spend a lot of time or less a lot of time. Okay. Uh, you can spend a lot of time cleaning up things and then a lot of time making iterative play blasts or previews, just like clean up something and make a preview and watch it. Okay. Uh, this is an inefficient way to work. Uh, I have uh, developed a system that seems to work for me. The other animators who have more experience have passed it on to me. Um, I, through the years of working at different studios, have run into other animators who have developed the same method or learned the same method, and and they always they were always um, they were always high performance animators in the sense that um, they we the people who you employ this tactic tend to not be late with their scenes. Okay, and there's a there's a whole psychology of animation that that's important to understand. If you're if you're constantly late on your deadlines, um, there's a pressure involved, and that does not allow you to have fun when you're animating. And this pressure tends to constrict your ability to think. Okay, pressure environments are not good. All right, so I like to put workflows and techniques into place that allow me to be free of that pressure. Okay, there's always going to be some performance pressure in this business. That's just the way it is. But anything you can do to make that pressure less um, heavy on yourself to allow yourself to do your best work in a relaxed but focused way, um, I think is good. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a lecture on that, um, explaining how I do previews and how I, I mark things down and, and just exactly how I think through so that I'm not wasting my time making endless play blasts, fixing endless things. Okay. It does require that I do make previews, but I use it, I try to do it in a smart way. Anyhow, uh, before I dawdle too much longer on this, I want to go ahead and get in and uh, start showing you how I, you know, start cleaning up the arms in, in a linear sense and start talking about um, uh, what it takes to clean up splines. Okay. And, uh, and then I don't imagine I'm going to have enough time to get fully through the spline conversation this month because I do want to talk about the, the 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 way I do previews. So we'll most likely uh, start spline conversation this month, and then VTS 26 is it's very likely that we're going to have to carry over some of that work there. Um, but anyways, uh, enough of me rambling. Let's go ahead and get into it. 
All right, getting back to our scene, we had cleaned this guy's torso up, you know, the core. We went for the hips right through the head and all that stuff. So we have um, we have all these things worked out. We've, we've uh, tested all these curves, and we've, we've just built them out in the way. And this one's all splined up in a few spots. But um, we see that, you know, I've gone through here, and I've, and I've kind of tested this out, and I, and I made sure that this is... This is working the way I want. Remember, I tested these things. And you just look at for VTS24 to see all that stuff, okay? Um, but what I do is, after I do the core, then I just go out the limbs, and I do the same thing. So I look at I look at the arm, and as I scrub through it, I just look for... Really, I don't really look at so much uh, the controllers as, as I look at what's going on here. Now, um, I had built the breakdown before, but I think it's good to revisit that this is usually where I'm going to find problems on in-betweens, okay? Um, the arm swings through, but instead of staying low down here, it's coming up high. So rather than, what I want to do is I want it to, to feel like it's swinging through in a simple arc. So I know that I can't do anything here because it's just a rotation, so that's not going to fix it. I could do it here, but, you know, that that may or may not fix everything. So what I want to do is is come up here and kind of fix it okay working from the root out G generally a good idea is you just keep working from the root out so if you have problems in the arcs of the hands or the paths to clean things up clean them up from the root out try and fix problems from the the controller closest to the root first okay so if there, if you have a hitch in the arm like we had one here but I know I'd fixed all of this stuff I know I'd fixed the hips I'd fixed the chest I'd fixed all of that and that's all playing smooth. So then the next logical thing to work with is the upper arm control, since this is an FK system. Okay, If this were an IK system, of course, I would have to go back out here to the end, because that would be the control that drives it. But since it's an FK system, I'm trying to stick as close to the root as possible. Uh, if there's a shoulder controller, which there is, um, and I had animated that quite extensively, I could look at, I could look at controlling that but I really didn't do a whole lot of animation on that if you take a look at the graph editor I mean there's some things going on um, but what I want to try and do is you know work with the largest controller closest to you know closest into um, the root of things and what what that does is it keeps you from trying to experiment with things and then adding these things up because all of these all of these systems are hierarchical okay so what I want to do is I want to try and solve the most I, I want to try and get the most mileage out of the least amount of effort and the easiest way to do that is to work from the root so if we have an arm swinging and it's you know I want it to kinda of come down a bit I want it to swing under and up and over that's I'm gonna I'm gonna try and work it from there okay now another thing I want to try and do here is I want to build a bit more of a bit more of an arc to or you know an overlap to it so this is like a really extreme in between where that elbow is leading and again I'm gonna try and do as much as possible right here in this upper controller okay um, and you'll find that I really don't need to do a whole lot with this one I could do a few things with it you know and I could do a little thing you know little things right here to kind of enhance it but for the most part I'm trying to do as much as possible closest to the root and you're gonna find that that will be true of everything you want if you've got problems with this arm right here tracking a certain way which there really aren't any because I fixed a lot of that stuff back in my back in my uh, step blocking but what I want to try and do again is if I find something that I don't like I want to try and control it you know more with the upper controller like right here there's some really crappy in between say how it, his arms face like this and then something in going back this this in between the x-axis is all is all goofy so what I want to do is I wanted to I want to try and fix that primarily first from something closer to the root okay now that doesn't get everything solved so what I want to do in, is, is I gotta get in here and I gotta I gotta build a bit more you know of this of this thing work in a certain way so it, it flows better but and I haven't even touched the fingers yet but the whole idea is to try and fix it from the root first okay if you fix it from the root first uh, what you end up with is it's just it's easier to add little things on top of it try and get the most mileage out of it first okay 
Um, since feet are almost always IK, well, you don't really have much back close to the root to work with, so you just work with the IK controllers. And if your hands are IK, you don't have a controller back close to the root, you just have the IK control. But the whole point is, is if you're working in an FK system, try and work from the root out when you're cl cleaning up the paths and the stuff on the linears and stuff like that. And, you know, is it perfect? No. Um, I will need to do some things. But what I can do is, is I'm pretty much at a point where even with just these few keys, the in-betweens are kind of working, you know, and, and stuff's working okay. So then what I want to do is, is I want to try and convert this stuff all the way over to splines. And what that usually looks like for me is I just select the controller, select the whole thing, and I use um, Michael Comet's Auto Tangent, which, you know, uh, you don't really have it in other programs, but uh, what it does is it just figures out and gets rid of the overshoot on things. But let's go ahead and take a look at um, one of these. Yeah, I'll, we'll take a look at this one right here. Let's say I take this and I'll just go ahead and zoom this up real big so you can kind of see it. I'm going to take the, you know, the whole thing. What I'll do is, sorry, I keep jumping around. I'll take the whole thing and I'll turn them into splines. Okay, so you make the whole thing splines. And then let's go ahead and take a look at each of these each of these curves. Now, a couple of things you want to try and do when you're working splines. Uh, if at all possible and you're using Maya, go ahead and turn on show buffer curves, okay? Uh, that's the gray version that you had before. What that'll do is that'll show you what the the curve looked like before in linear. That's kind of like your, your skeletal guide. And other programs have similar features. It kind of helps you guide your way through it so that you you know the motion was good with the linear before, so I, as long as my spline kind of honors that and stays relatively on course with it, I can clean things up and, and make it smoother, okay? Uh, but the show buffer curves is uh, right here. Right click in the graph editor, hit view, and then choose the show buffer curves option, okay? And it won't always be there. It'll just be there whenever you select a key or a curve, all right? A couple of rules about, about splines. You do not want this sloppy stuff right here. See this? This is called an overshoot, and this is called an undershoot. What's happening here is that it's moving away before it's moving, and that's kind of creating a mushy motion. All right, the mushy motion comes from when something waves back and forth like it's on the sea. It's going back and forth. Well, that's what's happening here. It's going back and then forth. We don't want that. So what we want to do is we want to tighten this down, okay? and we want to try as much as possible to keep that from overshooting so it doesn't slop one way and move back the other because remember these are values of how it's moving so if it's if the curve goes up one direction and then comes back down it, you know if this represents well translate z it's going to represent forward and backward it's going to go backwards and then it's going to move forward and that's going to make it feel mushy okay we don't want mushy um, oftentimes the beginning of a move I'll keep it flat tangent just for fun All right. Now getting in here, we have this right here where I want it to move smoothly through here, but what this is, this is creating like a little hiccup because it's moving smoothly and then it goes quickly and then it goes back the other way. So I don't like that. I want to try and smooth right through that. All right. Another thing, see this right here? That curve, that, that, that data point, that keyframe, that's not doing us any good. Look, I can delete it and look, the curve still maintains integrity to how I had built it before. The gray is what I had built in a linear and as long as my splines maintain not exact, it doesn't have to exactly pass through it, but it just needs to maintain the character of the motion that I had defined, then then I can clean it up and be confident that I'm not destroying what my motion is. And that's a common problem when people clean up splines. As they start getting in there and they start t tweaking handles all around, they start pulling things all over the place, and and they start kind of taking all the interesting edges off of things. They over they over polish it, and what happens is things start getting really mushy inside the viewport when they make a preview. And and that's that's a common problem when you're not sure what you're doing and you you kind of over clean things, and you're like, oh, what happened to my animation? It's it's all it's all ripped apart. You know, it's not it's not it lacks that life or that vitality that I had before. Another thing you want to do with splines. See how this kind of has a weird little kink right there. So it kind of comes up and goes weird. As much as possible, let the computer do what it's good at. In this instance, just let it ride through things, okay? Now, if you have if you really want to flatten that off, if you want that more like a soft hold, then you can go ahead 
and you can do that but what you want to try and do is you want to try and make transitions relatively smooth okay so try and find ways to just let the let the spline ride through the key and just kind of work its way through okay because uh, that's what computers are really good at like right here there's kind of a w weird hard hit there so what I would do is I would take a look at that key and say I don't need it it's not really doing me any good and then I can just take this and you know kind of just get through there and that key that's not doing me any good I mean I can get rid of it and it doesn't change the shape of the curve at all this key I can get rid of it tweak it a handle right there and now it moves through there smoothly okay and this key it's not doing me any good you know I can delete it and it's not really changing the the nature of the motion and that's generally 99 percent of how I clean stuff up is I've already tested it all all right when I was doing my linear cleanup so all I have to do is just maintain the general integrity of the motion as it's defined by this linear curve and I can start taking and deleting out keyframes that are uh, you know just creating noise in the motion and here's a good example of something that will have noise in the motion like if I take this guy and I convert him into splines you know you're gonna have you're gonna have these little junky moments in here where you know I don't need that key I can just get rid of it and if you're if the computer has less things to have to try and work out it ends up doing a better job and you think, well, gosh, Keith, these are these are barely noticeable changes. I mean, it doesn't really matter. I mean, I don't see how it's going to help. You'd be you'd be amazed when you stop and think about it. Like this key right here, I don't need that. I can let that ride right through there. And what you're doing is, when you do this, is you're you're taking away all these pieces of noise. Now it's like it's like collecting pennies, okay? And let's say each one. Each one of these little keys that I'm deleting that are really not doing anything to define the key, the, the curve. Here, let me go ahead. This is an undershoot. I don't want it undershooting. I want it to just move through that data point smoothly. Okay. Here's a weird kind of hitch. I want to kind of let it ride over the top a little bit smoother than that. Um, anyways, collecting pennies. If each one of these things that I take out represents, you know, one penny's worth of noise, well, you take out enough of them. The next thing you know, you look up, you've taken out $100 worth of noise. And I have students tell me all the time, I cannot believe how much cleaner my motion looks when I just go through on every one of these controllers, on every one of these channels, I take the time and just clean up these extra curves that aren't these extra data points that aren't doing anything. You know, like right here. You know, that key's not doing me any good and it's not really making a difference. I got an overshoot right there. So sometimes what I'll do is I'll actually move it down so it doesn't move right through there. Maybe I'll round off something. It doesn't mean, you know, this is this this is not like a master here it's it's a guide so I know it will just move softer through that okay and that just kinda creates more of an ease into that move that's fine I'm alright with that here we've got an undershoot don't really like the undershoot too much here I've got a little weird like if you zoom in on it uh, it's kinda hard to see maybe but there's kinda like a weird little under over kinda move to it it kinda goes underneath and then kinda comes over so I'm just gonna adjust the the handle so it just goes over and move smooth, smooth through it. Here we got an overshoot. Um, I don't want that overshoot really right there. This right here, um, I'll just kind of let it go through. Here it's kind of a little bit, a little bit wonky in through there. So I'll try and smooth that off just a little bit. And this gives you that nice smooth CG, you know, look that that everybody is hiring for these days. Okay. And here we got a little wobble. Here we got a really nasty overshoot problem. We don't want that. Okay, another overshoot problem. We don't want that. Got a little bit of a hard hit right there. So let's go ahead and kind of soften that hit by pulling that down, so that moves through smoother. And you can kind of see how it just makes the stuff look better. Here we've got an overshoot. I don't like overshoots. Okay, and what we do in here is we've got another overshoot. You get in here really close and you investigate these things. You zoom in. You realize, oh, that's an overshoot. Well, what I can do is I can just go ahead and pull that up and create just a softer ease right there and let this guy, you know, be flat. And what I've done is it's still the same kind of a move, you know. The 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 curve is the same relatively to the to the to the linear. It's just it's just had a little bit of polish done to it, okay? Taking the sharp edges off a little bit. You want to be careful, you don't want to overdo it. But the the thing is if you go through on each one of these channels and you take out all these little extra pieces of noise you're gonna find that the motion will just feel so much tighter and so much cleaner and and just it'll just feel more professional okay 
And that's really a difference. A lot of times between crappy cleanup and good cleanup is just taking the time to be professional about about how you handle your keys and how you clean stuff up and how you delete things out. I mean, I got keys in here that really aren't doing me any good, so I don't need them, man. I can I can just I can just ditch them. And you know, I can be pretty extreme about that as well, you know. I can take these two right here and just delete them. They're not doing me much. And then I can take that and flatten that off. And you notice I'm maintaining the general feel of the motion as I've defined it. I'm just going ahead and I'm just cleaning out the noise a penny at a time, as it were. Okay? And by taking out, you know, one penny at a time, uh, what I'm doing is I'm just taking all that little bit and sanding it off so that you can watch it and it's nice and smooth. And that's 90, like I said, 99% of my polish is this. And you notice how easy this is? This is, this is so simple. Um, now there's some more advanced things I'm going to cover next month, uh, little tips and tricks and stuff. But this is this is it. This is the bulk of my cleanup. I've already done the work um, inside of inside the linear, creating the structure that I want. Now what's left is for me to just make a pr preview of this and then start making notes and applying fixes on an individual basis. And that's what I want to talk about next because the way I do that again is more efficient than just finding my way through one thing at a time I tend to take a more whole whole character approach I work in in iterations okay and so let me talk about that for a little bit so you can kinda of see uh, my philosophy for how do you do previews and how do you do fixes okay Okay, so I, I had mentioned in the, in the introduction that we're going to talk about how to do previews. Okay, and let me give you a scenario and see if this sounds like you, because this was me in my early career. I got this thing, I'm working on it, and I'm like, oh, the arm's not moving right. Well, let me, let me work on that. Okay, I'm work, uh, and let me try this. So I try something, and I'm like, I have no idea if that worked. And I only really didn't even think about it. I just said, let me try this, and I tried it. And then uh, I'm like, well, did that work? Well, what did I do? Well, I just, I'll, make, I'll, I'll make a preview. And when I was dumb, I made a preview of the whole scene. I'm like, oh, gosh, you know, I got to see it. So frame one to frame 100 or whatever. And I'm sitting there, and I make this giant preview to watch one little fix that I guessed would work. And naturally, it didn't work the first time. So I'm like, oh, I got to go back. And so I try something else. Then I'm like, well, let me be smart this time. I'll only make a preview of, like, you know, the frames that are important. So frame you know, 30 to 50. Okay, so I do that, and then I'm like, oh, wow. Okay, that didn't work. So I try something else. I'm like, well, did that work? I might try and scrub. Oh, yeah, I'll try and scrub it, but I don't know if scrubbing's not real time. Uh, I mean, scrubbing might be real time if you have a really, really fast puppet or a fantastic computer, but most of the time, scrubbing is not real time, and it is not also accurate time. Okay, you don't scrub perfectly at 24 frames per second just not not humanly possible okay you can be close but most of the time we don't you know we slow down and speed up and we do it's variable speed so you don't really get a true picture as to what you're getting so you scrub a little bit but you're like well i really don't know if that works so you go ahead and make another preview you're like oh okay that guesswork didn't work and so you just keep chasing this tail you keep chasing your tail okay and what you find is a, a little fix in the arm which you thought was just a little problem, ends up taking half the day. You know, half the day just to fix a little hitch in the arm, and you get frustrated, and you keep making previews, and you keep trying things, and you go back to the beginning, and you're like, ah, screw it. And you open up a previous version of the file, and you're like, oh, let me start from scratch. And then you do it again, and you keep going down this path, and eventually you kind of find something that sort of works for you. Okay, something you like. And the next thing you know, you look up, it's 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and, you know, like, Geez, where'd the day go? I've still got all these other things to fix, you know? This was me. This is many young animators, many animators I've worked with, okay? The problem is, is you're not thinking. I wasn't thinking. I'm not trying to say you aren't thinking. I'm just trying to say we aren't thinking, all right? We're not thinking. What we're doing is we're just throwing something against the wall and then trying to see if it works. And the only way to see if it works is to just make a preview. Well, okay, there's a certain amount of question about everything we do okay I mean if there's a problem it's because you didn't know how to do it right in the first place make sense okay if there's a problem in the motion of the arm it's because somewhere in building that motion you didn't know how to do it the right way if you did you wouldn't have made it wrong right makes sense to me 
Well, so there's always a, a, a knowledge gap. There's always an ignorance factor. All right, I don't know how to do that, and you can't. I can't blame a person for not knowing what they don't know. It's just reality, you know. Don't don't blame me if I don't know about quantum physics. I've never studied it. Okay, I'm an animator. I'm a quantum physics guy. Don't ask me what a quark is. I have no idea. Okay, I've heard about it, but don't ask me. You can't blame me for not knowing something I don't know. Unless it's my responsibility to know. Then you can blame me. Okay? As an animator, it's not my responsibility to know what a quark is. It is my responsibility to know how to make something move well. So, we've got this, this motion. And we've got lots of motions. We've got lots of things. So how do we handle it? Well, the first thing you need to do is you need, as I'm always saying, think a little bit longer before you do something. Okay? It's almost like the universal rule of animation. If you want to do something, take a few moments and think it through. Then do it. Okay? So we have, uh, let's say we have a, an arm motion. And we say that, you know, there's a, there's a little hitch, in the, a little wobble in the arc. Okay? Take a moment. And really study that. And study that in the play blast you've made, the preview you've already made. Okay? Before you try something, think about what you should try. All right? If it's, a, if it's an IK thing, if it's an IK arm and there's, a, and there's a hitch, then you can kind of say, okay, well, all rotations or all positions of the arm are based off of the motion path, the position, the translation of the IK controller. So if there's a hitch here, all I have to do is find where it's going down and move it up. But if that causes it to do this, well then all I have to do is say, okay, it's good to here, mark it, bad here, but good here again. Okay, key that, so key where it's good to, it's bad here, and then key where it's good again, and then go back to the bad one and fix it. So now what you get is this, instead of this, all right? Think it through. If it's IK, think about translations. If it's FK, think about rotations. And then think about what axis you're going to rotate on. Okay? So if the arm is doing this, just a very simple thing. Arm's doing this, and you want it to go straight across. But it does this instead. Well, what axis is causing that? Is it, is it coming from this and rolling over? Well, that's a Z axis. You know, find the axis of this, and it's not happening in the it's not happening in the hand. Okay, you have to study it, and you have to figure out where's the problem. The problem is not just at the end point. Nine times out of ten, nine times out of ten, if there's a problem at the end of a hierarchy, it's usually solved going up the hierarchy. Okay, so if your hand isn't arcing right, don't change the hand keyframes if it's an FK system. If you're, because the arcs are happening up here. They're not happening with the hand. The hand just follows where the boss tells it to go. All right? In an FK hierarchy, this is the boss, this is the sub boss, this is the child. All right? Dad, mom, hand, if you follow that traditional patriarchal system. Anyways, so if you've got a hitch here, well, don't look at the hand if it's an FK system. If it's an IK system, you have to look at the hand because the IK is the boss. And this is just following orders. So you have to think. Okay, what am I thinking? So if it's an FK system, go up here. Think, okay, well, it's an all-rotation system. There's no translate going on. Maybe. Most rigs there isn't. But just investigate it. Think it through and say, well, okay, well, it's kind of going like this and then going up. Well, then look at your puppet and say, well, what axis is controlling this? Maybe that's an X-axis. I don't know. D different rigs, it's different things. I can't give you a single answer that works. It's your job to find out. Think it through. And then write it down. Write down what you think you're going to need to do to fix it. Okay? So you write down, uh, say it's an x-axis. X-axis at frame 23, upper right arm. Okay, that's all you need to do, is just write a little note to yourself. Then, find the next problem. Don't go fix that one. Okay? <laughs> Here's the rule. Instead of making endless, endless previews and play blasts to try and solve every single problem, I tend to work like a, like a sculptor, okay? A sculptor does not go in and take one section of the sculpture and take it all the way down to its fine level of finish while the rest of the sculpture remains in a rough, rougher form, okay? They work iteratively over the whole sculpture. 
they go the whole sculpture rough and then the whole sculpture they work to refine a little bit more and then the whole sculpture they work to refine it even more and then the whole sculpture they refine it even more it's not until the whole thing's almost done that they start getting in and start doing really really fine detail on small little parts that need more detail while the rest of the parts probably just need a little sanding okay so I tend to work the same way rather than burrow down a rabbit hole of one problem at a time, making endless previews and trying to fix that thing perfectly with a bunch of different experiments, which is ultimately a waste of time, I tend to work at the whole thing. I make a preview of the whole thing. And then I hit play and I bring out my notebook and my pen and every problem I see, I write it down. It's real simple. Just write it down. Okay? You write down everything you can see. I mean, everything you can see. Watch that thing, scrub through it, frame step through it. You're going to be there 20 minutes, half an hour. Depends. Do not stop looking at it until you can't see any other problems. Okay? Write down everything you can see. Work from the core out and just write down every problem that you can see and identify, all right? This is important because it's training your eye and it's training you to have patience and think, okay? Then don't just hop in and start trying to guesswork your way through it. After you've identified every problem, now go back and try and identify a possible solution. Think ahead, think, what can I do? Um, I have this rotation problem right here. Well, take a couple of minutes study the rig, study the motion, and say, I think, with a reasonable degree of certainty, I think if I fix the x-axis rotation at frame such and such, that will fix it. So you start prescribing an idea, prescribing a solution before you start actually trying to implement it, okay? If you just go in there and try stuff, you're, you're searching for happy accidents again, okay? And this whole, the whole point of what I'm trying to tell you is to avoid the happy accident syndrome. It's not an accident if you prescribe it, okay? And you can't prescribe it unless you take the time to think about it and investigate it. It's like a doctor. You can't just walk into a doctor's office and have him say in five minutes, well, I don't know. You know it sounds like you got some kind of a problem here. Try this drug. Well, that's not a doctor. That's a hack. Okay, you wouldn't trust a doctor like that. I wouldn't. I've had them try that on me. I don't like it. Like, no. You, you, what do you mean you're giving me this this medicine. You haven't even got a physical and a blood test yet. You're giving me medicine? This is insane. No. You have to think it through. You're the professional. You're the animator. It's your responsibility to know. Ah. And so, what we want to do is we want to give you the tools to do that. So think. Think all the way through it. Get all the way down in there. Find every problem. And then think through what every solution is. You're not going to be right all the time. But you'll be right a lot of the time. If you think it through, build on your experience and what you've learned, okay? And if you don't have any experience, well, this is how you learn it. This is how you get experience. You think it through, try something, it works. Yay, I know what I'm doing. It doesn't work. Woo, I have to try it again. No big deal. So, you go ahead, you make your preview, write down everything you can see, take the time until you can't find any other problems, and then go through each problem and try and prescribe a possible solution that you can try. Then, go into your scene and try your solutions. You got your cheat sheet right there. And you're gonna have a lot of items and you'll be there a long time. It's okay. You've got your marching orders. You just go through and you do them. All right? Fix this problem when you think you've got it fixed. You don't do a bunch of play blasts here. Don't do a bunch of previews. Just do what you think, step through it, maybe scrub through it, do what you need to do to quickly check your idea in, in the scene as best as you can and then move on to the next thing okay and don't make a preview of it don't give in to the urge to check your work and make sure it's okay don't do it okay trust your prescription all right then after you've gone through your entire list you might be there a few hours or more depends how long your list is you go through your entire list and you've done everything you can think of and you've marked off everything you could see, everything that was relevant to that pass of your cleanup, then make a new play blast or a new preview and see the whole thing and just repeat the process. You'll make that one play blast or preview of all of your prescriptions and then you're gonna check and see how accurate your guesses were or 
not guesses, your prescriptions were. You're going to check and see just how close you got to it. And you know what? You're going to find that about half of the things you solved them. And the other half, you didn't quite solve them. Or maybe introduce new ones. Or the next level, you just find new stuff. Okay? So you just repeat the process. Watch it all the way through, marked on everything you can see. Then work out a prescription for every solution. Then go back to your scene without making endless previews and testing them. Just make them, test them in the scene, get your best your best effort to make it work, making it fixed, do all of them, make another preview. You'll end up making five or eight previews on a scene instead of 50 or 80. Okay? And trust me, the time savings will be enormous, but you'll have to trust your pre prescriptions, and you are going to make mistakes. I don't get it right all the time. I'll go through, my particular average right now is about half. Okay? Eh, maybe a little more half, probably two-thirds. So I'll go through and I'll watch everything and I'll investigate it and I'll take a prescription out on it and I'll say, this is what I need to do. And then I'll go ahead and I'll work it. And as I work it, um, I test it out really quick in the scene, a little scrub, a little step frame through it if it's a slower rig, just to kind of see it. And I know what it's going to look like the way I want it to look. And so I get maybe my first pass, I'll have 40 or 50 items. Well, really? Really? You know, linear pass, I'll have 40 or 50 things that I'd just like, well, I'd like to fix this, I'd like to fix that, this isn't right. Your list might be longer, it might be less long. It's up to you, okay? You, but try and find everything you can see. I've got a developed eye, so I'll have a really long list usually, okay? If your eye for animation isn't as developed, your list might not be as long. But that's okay. Don't, don't feel like you've got to do it to the same level I do. Just feel like you've got to do it, okay? So I'll have 40, 50 items in there. I'll go through and I'll fix those 40 or 50 items, and then I'll make another preview, and I'll look at that, and my list will probably be 15, 20, 25 items. Not bad. It's certainly better than 50, right? And then I'll go through and I'll fix those, and I'll, again, I'll make another preview, and I'll have another 12 items. And I'll just keep doing that until I'm down to the point where I'm just fixing one-offs, one little thing here and there, one little thing right there. And that's on a sculpture basis, I'm working the whole sculpture, refining it, refining it, refining it. Once I get down to like five or six problems, you know, below five or six problems, I start working on them individually. And that's where you can spend the time working on a particular little thing and making a preview and trying it. The cool thing about this approach is that it, it, it's methodical, yes. Okay, methodical has gotten a bad rap in this world, but it's methodical meaning you have a method, <laughs> you're not just inventing the wheel every time you show up to work, but you go through it and there's a process and there's, there's a prescription, there's a thought beh pattern behind it, okay? Animation is, is, is not like you show up every day and you have to rediscover the meaning of how to do it. It shouldn't be that way. So you go ahead and you work your way through it, and then at the end, you're experimenting. You're trying something. Yeah, hey, what would it be like if I did a little head shake right there? Well, the whole thing's working. You've cleaned it all the way down. And I'm going to show this in future videos. You get it all the way down. Now you're time to play, man. You're looking at the clock. Deadline's tomorrow. I got six hours of work on this thing. It's looking pretty good. Now I got time to play. Now I can try the little detail things. Here's the thing about detail. There's a lot of emphasis on detail and polish in, in CG animation. There's a tendency to believe in a younger, less experienced animator that if there's something wrong with the animation, all you need is more detail on it, and that will make it better. No, it's just noise on top of poorly constructed foundation, okay? If you have a problem with the foundation of the movement, you have to go ahead and fix that, and then you build your detail on top of it. I mean, detail is like icing on the cake. You can't put icing on no cake. You can't just make a mound of icing and say there's cake. That's kind of gross, all right? So that's my process, and I, it's the same. I've met many animators who have a very similar, if not exact, way to do that. Okay, here's the results. Less pressure. Okay, you go through and you and you work this out, and you say, okay, well, I've, I've I'm thinking this and this and this, and I've done this, this and this, and then you just you just work it through, and there's no pressure because if somebody comes by and says, what are you doing? You say, I got my list of fixes right here. Okay, and you're not wasting time waiting for the computer to make its preview. And trust me, kids, I know how I know the real world. I've lived in it, all right? So you make a preview. Uh, this is going to take a couple minutes. You dial up a website or a form or, you know, YouTube or whatever it is you're into. And next thing you know, you look over and like, oh, that's been done. 
how long has it been done? I don't know how long it's been done. Maybe you write off emails. I mean, you, it's easy to get distracted when you're waiting for the machine to draw your pictures. All right? And when you do that, you waste time. And when you waste time, you put yourself in a pressure position. It's hard enough to do this stuff on time when you're really working at it. Um, a feature film environment, people tend to think that, oh, it'd be so wonderful if I could only have to do three seconds a week. Why worship at the altar of inefficiency? Why not be better off to say, I know how to do top-level work at eight seconds a week? Why not? These old school dudes, man, these guys would do 25 feet a week. In case you're not adding up at home, that's about 18 to 19 seconds of keyframe animation a week. Of course, they weren't in-betweening it, but the in-betweener was really just making drawings. They were only going off of the timing charts, the poses, the breakdowns, and all the other things that these animators were doing. So don't, don't worship at the altar of inefficiency. Instead, try and work on yourself so that if you are in a production environment where you do not have the luxury of doing three or four seconds a week, but you have to do eight to ten seconds a week, well, don't give them eight to ten seconds of garbage and make yourself work 80 hours a week just to get there. It doesn't make any sense to me. There's life outside of animation. For you young guys, you may not believe this, but it's true. There is life beyond animation. And so you want to be able to live that life so that you can bring that life to your animation. If you're just working 78 hours a week, constantly crunching, constantly, and this isn't even when the whole crew is crunching. This is just you because you can't work stuff out. You're there 60, 70, 80 hours a week, every Saturday, coming in on Sundays, and the production isn't even in crunch, and you're coming in just because you're trying to discover something today and you're making endless previews and getting distracted and, and just throwing stuff against the wall and hoping it sticks. Stop and think. Stop and think. Uh, anyhow, I, I'm try it. Okay, it's going to feel really weird at first. You're going to feel like the first time you went swimming without a life preserver. You're going to be a little bit afraid. You're going to be frantic a little bit. It's okay. Just try it on a small scene, okay? Just try it small first and then get some confidence for it. But I'm telling you, every animator I know who's ever managed to survive in this business beyond the initial phase of infatuation with being an animator, meaning anybody who's a professional usually employs this workflow to some degree or another, okay? To some degree or another. Not everybody does it maybe as strictly as I do it, but everybody employs this to a certain level if they're going to maintain their, their career for longer than 10 years. Because you just can't keep burning 60, 70, 80 hours a week trying to find and scrub your way through things. It just, boy, that's, that's a rough way to make a living. Um, so I just wanted to offer that to you as a, as, a, as a helpful tip. Try it out. And if you got any questions, hey, just let me know and I'll try and help you through it. All right? So that's the idea of how I do my reviews and corrections. It's a really important part of the cleanup phase because I see so many animators wasting their time making the cleanup phase harder than it needs to be just because they don't really work efficiently and don't stop and think. That's the thing. I'm going to constantly remind you, stop and think because that's what was beaten into my head. Dude, stop and think. Don't just do stuff. Think it. All right? You think it? All right. Now you can do some. All right. All right, I, I hope that was helpful. <laughs> um, anyways, I, I hope it was clear to you. I hope it's opening doors. I've been getting a lot of feedback from people, a lot of emails saying these, these videos are really, really helping me unlock a lot of doors and really helping me get better at my job and um, a better understanding of what it means to really animate and not just be a discoverer of happy accidents. And we're always going to be discovering happy accidents. It's the nature of the business. Any creative, um, any creative endeavor like that, you're going to, you can't ever just set down a plan on day one and say, I'm never going to deviate from it. Okay. You've got to give yourself freedom to discover things, okay? But that's different than building your entire life on discovering things, all right? It's one thing to have a, a steady, reliable, predictable workflow that you can count on, and when that comes to a scene, a, an idea as to what you want to do, it's like the foundation of what you want to do. But if every day you have to come to work and you're just hoping you find something, that's pressure, and I talked about pressure before, and, and so what I want to try and do is help open these doors for you. So thanks for the emails. Thanks for letting me know that these things are helping you. Um, I'm really just telling you how I learned how to do things from 
multiple animators. I don't have any one source. Uh, I, I learn things from co-workers and CG. I've worn things from co-workers and traditional. I've learned things from guys I've never worked with but had a chance to talk to. I've learned things from, uh, you know, dudes who are, you know, been animating for three years and guys who've been animating for 30 years. I mean, the, the influences are broad. Um, a lot of reading, a lot of talking, a lot of trying, a lot of different things. Um, I'm hoping to just kind of compress all this down for you, and I'm thankful that uh, I'm able to help you guys out with this stuff. Okay? Um, so that's it for this month. Uh, next month we continue the conversation. Okay, I want to continue the conversation on the spline business. Um, we're going to get into that just uh, really down into details, and we should wrap that up next month. Um, and that will be that will be a good thing. And then we can move on into other things. I have plans to do facial animation. Okay, coming up uh, in the next few videos, and uh, just to you know spend several months talking about the the intricacies intricacies of facial animation uh, we're going to talk about lip sync we're going to talk about animating the face as a whole we're going to talk about brows and blinks and and connective tissue and uh how to how to be accurate yet expressive and and just there's a lot of there's a lot of things to think about when it comes to facial animation you just can't sit there and say make the lips flap and just just go okay there's there's a lot to it so that's what's coming up as soon as we finish up this this whole blocking the cleanup conversation all right so stick with it if you've been one of those people who've emailed me saying when are you going to get to lip sync and facial animation well it's coming you know when, when the next several months we're going to be in it and we're going to be in it for a few months and we're going to really dig into the bottom of it as far as i know how to dig all right and i i, I admit right now i am I am at this point in my career, I do not know everything I need to know. I am, I'm a student with the rest of you. I keep learning and growing just like the rest of you. All I'm trying to do is pass on what I've learned to you so that you don't have to wait till your 14th year of doing it to, to learn this stuff, okay? Um, I wanna try and jumpstart your careers. I wanna help you guys get to a point where you are able to do these things, but you don't have to wait 14 or 15 years to get there, okay? Um, and that's fine. I, I, I don't ever want to put myself across as a master or a guy who knows it all because I really don't. I just know what I know today and I'm willing to share that with you. Okay? So anyways, thanks again for being a part of the VTS. Thanks for your support. Thanks for allowing me and my family to do things that are really important to us with, uh, with the funds from the VTS. Um, a little bit of, you know, just a little update. We're, we're installing water, water filters in rural homes that uh, are really bringing some good things. I mean, people are cleaning, drinking clean water for the first time in their lives. And uh, the, the health benefits and the life benefits that come from that are really, really fantastic. And we've got a medical boat that we've got going in one city. We've got, um, uh, we've just built a medical and a dental clinic in another city, or helped build it. We didn't do all of it. I mean, there's many people involved in these works. Don't take the impression that I'm doing everything, because I'm not. But the VTS is a valuable tool and a valuable resource for me and my family to be able to do these things that are really important to us, that bring, that bring blessings to people who this world has not blessed very much. And um, so I want to thank you for being a part of it. I want to remind you um, that that is why I do this. And I also want to help you guys. You know, I mean, I like teaching. It's fun. But there's always that other thing going on, okay? So anyways, until next month, I want you guys to be good to yourselves. Keep animating, keep practicing, keep asking questions, keep pushing forward, and uh, be good to each other. All the best and God bless.